of the historical European martial art, studying various type books and sensor manuals in order to aid their interpretations of medieval combat techniques. In my experience, although I'm sure this differs to clubs all over the globe, students are introduced to a certain technique from a manuscript, practice it repeatedly to the greatest of their muscle memory, and then go on using it in free play and sparring. A lot of attention is often given to specifically following the written instructions or copying the visual representation of the technique. Because in these classes students strive to follow the fight book so closely, many new students are often left with the impression that despite the gap of several hundred years, they are learning how to fight in the same way as knights and men at arms did in the Middle Ages. If one was to make a very lazy attempt to team the sport amongst feast and famine, uh, the current situation in the uh, Pima community at, at large could perhaps could perhaps be described as an enthusiast sitting down for the first time expecting a feast of reliable martial arts, where for any strollers, in fact, to be um, a bit of a famine. Well, not, not a famine, but you'd, you'd leave feeling a bit hungry. However, it's abundantly clear that this learning in absentia was not the original <coughs> purpose for several of these doctrines, especially those produced within the 15th century. Indeed, it's likely that several masters would be turning in their graves if they knew to what extent their closely guarded secrets were now being studied. The Italian Filippo Vari states um, an expressed desire that his art should not fall into the hands of low-born men, the majority of us modern practitioners and scholars on the subject, um, but should be reserved for anybody of pers perspicacious talent and lovely limbs, courtiers, barons, princes, dukes, and kings. In a similar vein, his countryman Fiore di Liberi writes how he only fought his art in secret, even fighting five duels in order to keep others from learning his methods. However, this concern with nervous students for secrecy was not always the case. Le Jeu de l'Eache, an anonymous 15th century manual, advocates that the said axe play is honorable and profitable for the preservation of the body noble or non-noble. Yet for scholars with an interest in these books and how they represent strategies of communication for educating the arms and nobility in the late Middle Ages, there are certain ways through which we may attempt to ascertain the original purpose of these manuals and how their creators wish them to be used. In order to relay information practicing with regarding the practice of combat to the reader, fight books rely on a combination of pictorial and literary means to convey their message. This could, for example, be seen in several manuals, such as the Getty version of Fiore de Vitalia, produced by Fiore de Liberi, where he's uh, relying on a combination of text and images. Um, other manuals, such as Part C of Codex Wallenstein, here in the center, uh, lack such instructions and rely, entire, in, rely entirely on pictorial representations of combat. There are several other sources which rely purely on text, such as the Guarte Portugal Foot and Horsemanship. Um, and as a quick aside, um, certain manuscripts, such as Le Jeu de l'Eche, appear to have been designed with illustrations in mind, but were left unfinished, and so today uh, we're somewhat limited in what we can actually study. <coughs> the following paper is concerned with how these devices, despite their often laconic nature, sought to convey the master's knowledge or promise of knowledge in absentia, and how from these, and the differences between them, we can determine how their creators hoped they would be used, as well as the type of information they wanted to convey. This should be done in three ways, each, one that each related to the diplomatics. The first of these is to have studied the text for facing the educational and martial content of these manuscripts. Often, sensory masters such as Fiore de Liberi and Filippo Vardi, who will feature prominently throughout this, throughout this paper, <coughs> enlighten themselves to the main purpose for writing. The second area this paper shall cover is the role of language used in fight books. Exactly how an individual has deigned to recall his knowledge, especially in the choice of language and sentence structure, gives us a much stronger understanding as to his intent, as shown upon the past. Finally, I shall turn to discussing the relationship between the textual and visual elements of 15th century manuals. In some manuals, one can see how illustrations have been used in order to generate a basic idea of what the master is teaching, um, whilst others act as a declaration as of the master's martial ability. Through this, my paper hopes to highlight differences in how these manuals are intended to be used uh, <coughs> compared to how they are used by modern practitioners of Pima, and raise questions as to how or if they should be reflected in how the vast majority of the individuals today practice Pima. It is perhaps somewhat fitting then to begin this talk with a discussion regarding the prologues of 15th century fight books. For example, one of the most intriguing elements of Il Fior di Battaglia, uh, produced by Fiore di Liberi at the dawn of the 15th century, is his list of previous students. On the first folio of the manuscript, uh, yeah, uh, he has a list of several students who have had to fight in duels. 
We saw that Piero del Verde, the Chola Richelino, Gariato of Mantua, and several others taught by him went on to use their lessons to defend either the, their physical well-being and honor in combat. This list serves several purposes of itself, giving historians a stronger idea as to the overweighing of the manuscript. It primarily shows anyone that the book's owner, uh, sorry, it primarily shows anyone that the book's owner may eventually show it to, that others can trust it to glory, not only with their coins, but also their physical well-being. Indeed, one may take his declaration that he has been well rewarded by obtaining the esteem and set the esteem and affection of his students as a clever way of convincing the reader that he is a worthy investor. This is made even more apparent when one considers that Pure is not just describing any set of students he has taught, but those who actually had to use his lessons in order to fight at the barriers. As, as such, it strongly implied the text that the techniques on the following pages um, are ones which have been proven to work on no less than six occasions, or eleven if one includes the five tools that Pure himself had to fight, and therefore are techniques that one can trust. Indeed, Fiore even claims that not one of his students has he made a loser in this art, further exalting his own abilities as a teacher. If one looks further into the personal lives of the individuals in this list, um, then their inclusion further reinforces this point. Uh, for this, we need to look no further than excuse me, a Galeasho, a man who fought with and held his own against Usico, one of the most renowned fighters of the age. The inclusion of this um, and the news of a duel which spread across Europe to be used by Fiore as proof that he was tutored to some of the most prestigious fighters in, in Europe, enhancing his own reputation and hopefully point out. When viewed as part of the entire manuscript, the purpose of this list is easier to define. It is clearly supposed to be a declaration of Fiore's ability both as a teacher <coughs> and more importantly as a fighter, reinforcing the, valid reinforcing the validity of the techniques on the pages to come. <coughs> this declaration of martial ability may have been an attempt to secure further patronage if anyone saw the book. And this concept was returned to throughout the paper in regards to the Bardi and Tauhaka. Unfortunately, no other fencing master relies on the same technique as Fiori does here by providing us with a list of students. Um, yet there are other comparisons which may be made. One may argue that Fiori's list of previous students echoes the role played by the long, witness, by the long list of witnesses in several <coughs> early medieval legal texts by attesting, by attesting to the validity of the document. Ultimately, the presence here serves to act as proof of the legitimacy both of Fiore's skill and his ability to impart this to others. Yet, Fiore is not the only 15th century master to debate his corpus of material for the prologue. Philip Bavari, who many have seen at best as spiritual successor to Bavari and at worst a shameless copyist, um, also opened his manuscript with a lengthy introduction. Like Fiore, he provides the reader with an, albeit very limited, a biography of himself, in which he also champions the usefulness of learning how to fight and voices his wish that through the writing of his manuscript, um, his techniques, well, he, he, is, he uh, will go on to be remembered himself. But the vast majority of the introduction of the Liber de Arte Gladiatoria de Mutandi is actually a 16 chapter tract in which Vardy outlines his martial law philosophies, prefaced with the message, and I apologize for my awful Italian pronunciation. Si tu areai nel terulo tu sale, al de bisogna qui considerate, or via. Um, translated literally, it means if you have salt on your brain, you must consider here the best way to find these stairs. Um, which I think is a wonderful phrase. Um, <laughs> having, having salt on your brain is, um, according to the translators of this piece, uh, force you on melee. Um, sort of, if, you're, if you're a clever mind. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't really have time to go into all the contents of the in just <coughs> introduction. Um, it covers a lot of ground, um, with Vardy discussing the relationship between, between science, art, and fencing, um, when one ought to fight, the qualities a fighter ought to possess, and how seriously one should actually fight once the combat has begun. His decision to discuss such topics at length, however, can be taken as him trying to establish his credentials as a fencing master. When one bears in mind that Vardy's value was a gift to the Duke of Rubino, at whose court he may have resided desired patronage, we once again see that, like Fiore, Vardy's main focus here is in the prologue is not the teaching of swordsmanship, but in fact rather uh, to show off his ability as a fencing master. The employment of language in many fencing manuals also hints as to their creator's intent. Multiple authors from the 15th century, <coughs> namely Fiore and Vardy, rely heavily on rhyming verse in order to convey their instructions, 
I've seen the examples here from my sections on Tom Max and Paul Waxy. Um, I'm not going to embarrass myself, but I, I'm very glad to do it actually. Um, so at first, these verses may seem too brief to convey any real knowledge of how to execute a complex technique, which is the translation below. Um, but this is not just lazy writing on behalf of the authors. Arguably, the students who have already studied with the masters and are now rereading these books, uh, these lines are not meant to be instructional, but designed to act as a mnemonic aid to remembering what has already been taught. Uh, this becomes clearer when the verses are read aloud, and one actually makes a genuine attempt at memorization. Uh, <coughs> Uh, number three. Uh, per questa presa il faro una volta presta, tu asha perdere la mia Ferrari e la testa. And several scientific studies have um, uh, shown that the, the link between uh, rhyme and memory actually helps reinforce what you've already learned. <coughs> um, okay, so it is then apparent that through their simple rhyming scheme, they're intended to assist in remembering previous lessons. Where the, intricacies, where the intricacies of each technique would have been ingrained through muscle memory, as opposed <coughs> to the part of the knowledge. I think that here it's not just the rhyming, but also the sort of short poetic couplet, couplets that helps this stick in the brain, rather than lengthy descriptions of text. Uh, yet their ultimately laconic nature further highlights how such manuscripts are not designed for new... Sorry. Yet their ultimately laconic nature further highlights how such manuscripts are not designed for new... <coughs> Uh, but rather for existing students, reinforcing previous suggestions made by Monshine and Blockstein. On the other hand, for those of you who have not come across these sources before, I imagine that you can get a basic understanding of what the masters here are trying to accomplish. Uh, for example, uh, number one and two, they're trying to bypass the opponent's advisor in the interface, uh, while three and four <coughs> is, is an attempt to, to disarm the opponent before striking him. Um, I feel that this was on, the, on behalf of the writer to make it known what is going on, but not how. It further reinforces grounds we've already covered. He is trying to convey a sense that he's a truly qualified tough penalty master, more than likely with the aim of hoping that should anyone see the manuscript, they'll come to him to learn further about how to do what he's given the outline of here. Admittedly, Fiore himself was involved in the creation of multiple variants of his text, one being uh, Il Fior de Battaglia, as opposed to the cross for the fallen here. <coughs> Um, where a much more, where a slightly more comprehensive series of instructions can be found. Um, so if you look at these two uh, contrasting pages here, uh, this is a contrast of Fiori's section on Polax, where he introduces a, a pop that or does. Um, and just by comparing the two of these side by side, you can see that uh, in Fiori de Italia on the left, there's a much more of an approach to Fiori with an outline. Um, this has led to theories by scholars such as Monshine that Il Fior de Battaglia represents an effort on behalf of Fiore to produce a complete synthesis of his methodology as opposed to a purely mnemonic text. Yet Fiore and Vardy are clearly a product of their times, and their work simply cannot be seen as comprehensive instructional manuals. Arguably, a century later, Joachim Meyer would author such a manual, uh, designed to be used by those who never had the chance to study under him, an altogether different purpose to many 15th century masters. Uh, the reasons for this shift in the communication of information and the author's intent is clear, however. Increasing literacy, rising living standards, and the expanding role of the printing press in the 16th century led to unprecedented numbers of lay readers, lay consumers of books, which allowed Maya and other 16th century masters to present their knowledge in new and improved ways and once again try to profit from it. That is not to say that earlier 15th century authors were ignorant of writing descriptive treaties. Uh, the author of Le Jeu de Liège, for example, chooses to employ what appears to be descriptive rather than mnemonic language. Um, whereas Fiore and Vardy in the manuscripts we've seen can rely just on two lines to describe the entire technique, the anonymous author of Le Jeu writes lengthy and forms of paragraphs, as you can see here for these, for these comparisons. Um, this also serves to help scholars understand the intent of the author. Due to the lengthy instructions used, it seems likely to me that he is perhaps not simply writing in order to help a student recall previous lessons, but is primarily concerned with preparing a reader who hasn't had the chance to learn under him uh, to, to, to fight in a, a traditional combat without, without being on hand to assist. Um, that said, the view is left up, this view is left open to question as the author still makes several assumptions of the reader. We are often told how to. <coughs> 
how in order to perform a particular technique, and we ought to have either the cue or the qua or zag of the weapon ball. Uh, these being the top and bottom of the axe. Um, but aside from this, there's little indication regarding how the weapon should be held. Um, I imagine, however, that should those uh, that should the manuscripts have ever been completed and the illustrations inserted, this might have been um, somewhat clearer. Yet the exact opposite of this can be witnessed in the works of Hans Karlhofer in the 1459 and 1467 versions of his manuscript. The latter of, of which has been labelled by Mark Rector as intentionally arcane for, the unin for uninitiated fighters. Aside from some basic captions set alongside some of the illustrations, which themselves do not often form coherent sequences, <coughs> no text at all, these two versions contain very little explanatory text. Mm. It is this which has led Rector to conclude that, like the work of Fiore, uh, like the work of Fiore and Vardy, Kalpov's primary purpose is a declaration of his ability as at master of arms. Once again, through reading the captions where they are provided, the reader can gain the most basic possible understanding of what has been shown on the page, but has few clues to accomplish these techniques themselves. Kalpov must be sought out as a service of time. As such, several of Kalpov's modern critics, such as uh, Bart Wolczak, have uh, labelled him as an overrated source in historical European martial arts due to his overly cryptic nature and the lack of reverse information in his manual. Clearly, 600 years later, his work con continues to serve the original purpose that viewers are left enticed, eager, and curious, yet also confused and puzzled. Of course, many manuscripts are not simply made up of text, as we can see here, they're also um, full of images. Here, too, there's potential that images serve multiple purposes. Just as the basic rhyming structure in several texts aids the reader in remembering the lessons and thrillings of the techniques. So too may the images be described as serving a mnemonic function. For example, by simply reading uh, through the quotes of Fiori and Vardy above, it still remains very difficult to picture what the two masters are talking about. <coughs> but this becomes slightly <coughs> easier when they're put alongside the corresponding images. Um, so if we remember the technique through um, trying to bypass the opponent's eyes and strike them in the face, this is uh, the image that they both used to convey that, that, that sense of movement. Um, of course, if one's actually witnessed this technique carried out in person in the flesh, time and time and time again, the likelihood that you'll be able to remember the more intricacies just through the, the uh, re re refreshing your memory through these images probably helps a fair amount. <coughs> Even though um, a single image can only convey a snapshot of any physical action, they nonetheless provide a jogging of the memory in the same way as the rhyming instruction, simply through a different format. After putting this into perspective, it can be argued that the images too then have a mnemonic role to play. It cannot be understood, understated how, um, no. uh, but however, in the case of the cryptic Kalpoffer, uh, there's potential that they serve an altogether different purpose, relating to his desire to make it clear the value of the paragon. Here, the images themselves, much like Fiora's list of former students, once again serves the declaration of his martial ability, the aim to impress the reader through their visual content and entice them to purchase and help the service as, as a master of arts. Naturally, this means that the use of images in the modern study of HEMA by the majority of practitioners is fraught with issues. Although a picture can be superior to a thousand words, it still only details a single moment within time. Several masters describe the moves of varying complexity, yet in several cases provide us only with one or two images to move over this technique. Um, okay. um, apologies, I, sh I should have an, imi an, Im an image for this, but um, if we want again to refer to the Fiora section on the pole axe, then there are several instances of this. Uh, we're given point A from which the plays begin, and point B at which they end, which is, uh, I suppose, an example here on the left. Um, but there's nothing really to fill the gap. It is then clearly not the aim of Fiora that we ought to rely solely on his manuscripts to learn how to fight. Doing so can lead to an astonishingly wide range of potential interpretations. Arguably, it is through an attempt to mimic some of the imagery of various vetting master manuals, which has led to the infamous attempt of John Clement to establish the use of the flat over the edge to carry swords. Um, one, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> one teacher of Fiore, uh, Joe Windsor, has noted that the gap between practical technique and its pictorial, represent pictorial representation is very difficult to bridge. Um, and has several books preoccupied with trying to bridge this gap. Indeed, the existence of a whole series of books dedicated almost solely to explaining the meaning behind one book 
um, highlights several of the several of the problems with their presentation in the original text. <coughs> Ultimately, however, this seems to be in line with the majority of the purpose of these manuscripts, and that they were produced and given to initiates and the tutelage religious masters, as opposed to uh, given off from them um, uh, by themselves. So, just to quickly conclude, how does this all relate to HEMA in the context of modern practitioners? Quite simply, as this paper has hopefully demonstrated, although we can gain a thorough understanding of why these manuals were produced and how they were intended to be used, it's apparent that this has very little to do <coughs> with the vast majority of how these manuals are used today. So it's claiming that through study of these manuals we can have we can be certain that we are practicing thoroughly authentic styles of swordsmanship, as have some authors, are fundamentally mistaken. This can be summed up by a quick overview of Fiori's material which has been used by this paper. Through the case study of Fiori's list of students, it becomes apparent that one application of his work was to serve as a declaration of his ability at the Master's of Arms. The linguistic structure of his and others' texts further show how the authors intended them to be used, primarily, to a, uh, primarily as an aid to the lessons already imparted, as opposed to instructing the non taught Spencer. Finally, um, from the study of images, Watson also demonstrates how they were supposed to be used, how they were supposed to be used to assist the student's memory or attract new customers as opposed to imparting knowledge of a specific technique. Ultimately, despite the large amounts of research yet to be undertaken, the study of these areas struggles from gaining a much stronger understanding of historical European martial arts, the context in which their practitioners taught and fought, and communication strategies and the role of memory in the Middle Ages. Thank you.